props here. In 1974, one of our co-founders, Richard Barnett, uh, did this book, which was really the first path-breaking investigation of the power of global uh, corporations called Global Reach. And it was on my reading list in graduate school. So that's how I got turned on to IPS. And I then went to work there um, about 20 years ago to work on the follow-up to Global Reach, Global Dreams, with uh, Richard Barnett again, and, and then John Cavana, our current director. Um, so we've been working on these issues a long time, but we by no means have all the answers. So that's why I'm really looking forward to this panel. And also really happy to be up here with uh, people who represent four of the organizations we've identified as among our top 50 allies who are celebrating uh, this weekend as part of our 50th anniversary work. Um, the two people we've had the longest relationship with are Peter Weiss and Fiona Dove. Uh, Peter Weiss was with IPS from the very beginning uh, period as one of our first IPS board chairs. And he stuck with IPS through very difficult times, including the assassination of two of our, our colleagues by agents of the Chilean dictatorship. But what he's most famous for is uh, using the law in very creative ways um, uh, for uh, justice. And uh, among many of his accomplishments with other colleagues at the Center for Constitutional Rights, he resurrected this very obscure 1789 law and figured out how to, way to, to use it to hold individuals and corporations accountable in U.S. courts for violations of international law. Quite a feat. That uh, legal tactic has been under assault for uh, some years now, and so I'm really curious to hear what he's going to have to say about prospects for future legal strategies for holding global corporations accountable for their crimes. Um, Fiona Dove here uh, leads the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. TNI. TNI is a sister institute of IPS. It was uh, founded in Amsterdam about 40 years ago at a time when uh, the, the Institute for Policy Studies was very much under attack from the Nixon administration. They uh, put our leaders on their enemies list. They uh, spied on us. They sent more than 70 informants to uh, go through our trash and so forth. And so we were looking for a place to uh, establish a presence in a country that had a long history of tolerance, and that's how we wound up having a sister institute in Amsterdam. They've been independent since the 1980s and have become a real leading force, bringing together intellectuals and activists from around the world, especially from the global south. Um, so uh, we still work with them a lot on issues like transnational corporations and, and globalization. And so Peter and, and Fiona uh, are major thinkers at, on the international stage. Then we have some of our more recent allies uh, from IPS who focus more on US domestic issues. And so uh, George Gale is here, the head of National People's Action, another one of our very valued partners in IPS. They're a network of grassroots organizations dedicated to advancing economic and racial justice. And we've been working closely with NPA uh, recently on a, at least a couple of things. One is the idea of a, a small tax on Wall Street speculation that could help discourage short-term, uh, you know, the kind of casino gambling and also generate a lot of money for good things. And then I've also had a lot of fun working with them to delegitimize this very creepy corporate lobby group called Fix the Debt. Just basically a bunch of CEOs saying we have to cut Social Security in order to pay for more corporate tax breaks. Um, Britton Lofton is with Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. Uh, well, well. That's a nice group too. They're a coalition of uh, 10,000 restaurant workers, 100 high road employers, and thousands of consumers working to raise restaurant industry standards. And we've been working with Rock lately to provide some research and other support for their campaigns targeting the National Restaurant Association, which is a major corporate lobby group in DC, and the, the owners of or Olive Garden and Red Stop Lobster uh, restaurant chains as part of their work to uh, raise the minimum wage for tipped workers. So we have quite a panel today, and I thought what we would do is maybe go in a row like this, uh, starting with George Gale from National People's Action. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, just to the comment earlier, I, I can think of no greater uh, compliment the opposition can give us than ruffling through our trash. I think it's a, it's a sign we're doing something good. The other day I was 
coming home from a neighborhood park with my daughter, who's two years old, and uh, on the way we spotted this yard sale, and there were like a bunch of kids' toys there. I was like, hey, maybe, you know, I should just kind of do to buy her something. And, but it didn't take me long to be there to figure out, basically the mother was selling the toys to make rent. Um, and and, and you could just, we didn't get the details, but meanwhile, her seven-year-old had this little kind of craftsman tool set, I mean, really kind of cool toy. So it was like a kid's version of a drill or a saw or anything. He was walking me through lovingly how much how cool this toy was and how much he cared about it. But he was getting ready to sell it. And I just thought, I mean, this is like so sad. He's got to sell his craftsman toy so he can make rent. But what burns me up about that is like, that is not an accident. This kid has to sell his toy because somebody had a plan. A set of corporate elites had a strategy and a plan to create the economic moment we have now. And we could spend a lots of details talking about what that looks like, but it looks like little kids selling their toys because their mom can't make rent. So the big question for MPA, which is a national organization of working class families, like where do we go from here? I mean, there are like a bunch of different uh, courses we can chart out. And the three we always look at is the first, we just fight to save what we got. This is a tough economic and political moment. So maybe we could just kind of bear down, play defense, try to save people's homes, their jobs, and any progressive policies we've won in the past. But that's not inspiring. You, you know, you gotta go on offense if you wanna win. Defense alone is not gonna get us there. Second, we could try to get back to the old economy, which while certainly more hopeful than what we've got now, we know is marred by incredible racial and gender disparities and certainly was doing no favors to our plan. So we think what we need to do is actually allow ourselves to completely reimagine what's possible. That despite the dire nature of now, allow ourselves to rethink what our economy might look like. Because if we let this moment lower our expectations, we've already lost. We should just put up the white flag and give up. So for us, we can get into the details maybe in the question and answer of like our vision of what the new economy looks like. But there is no road to a more just, loving, and sustainable economy that does not include restructuring the purpose and the role and the power of corporations in the United States. And so we try to reach, for us, it's like, well, what are the interventions we're going to make to shift that reality from what we have now to where we need to go? And there are three that I want to talk about, two of which I would have not said even two years ago. So this is part of our evolution and our constant battle. MPA has been at battle with Wall Street and the big banks for 40 years. And we've had some moments of victory, but ultimately we've fallen further and further behind. So the first we think now is the time, and I'll continue the reasons that we're hopeful about this, to build a new independent political movement in this country. One that is principles before a party, one that is willing to challenge the corporate sector, one that is less about catering to the middle, but more about shifting where the middle is at, and one that is going to take ideas from the margins and move them into the mainstream. And the good news is right now, organizers all across the country who really come out of a 501c3 nonprofit, non electoral orientation are seeing the limits of that orientation. And so in cities and towns, people are building independent political organizations that are made up of mass groups of people that are going to be principles first, and those certainly have you know, no love for the Republican Party are going to be willing to induce tension into the Democratic Party. And so these organizations will disrupt business as usual for the corporate sector, in the political realm, and in the narrative realm. That's a new development. I can talk more about why we think that's actually going to happen. I actually think it will happen. It's just a matter of when. Second. The battle of big ideas. I don't think anybody in this room is lost on the fact we're not in a battle on issues. We're in a battle on ideas, around worldview, or what we used to call ideology. And though there's been like renewed efforts in this, in kind of the progressive sector to engage in the worldview battle, one of the biggest challenges we see is like, particularly to be honest, a lot of the progressive narrative that comes out of this city, it like lacks any real honesty. It's like it's been poll tested and watered down to what doesn't have any punch and for everyday Americans, and I grew up in southern Indiana, it doesn't mean anything. That's what it doesn't say anything. And so I think moving forward, if we're going to try to win the battle of big ideas, we have to think about actually saying the truth, which is that capitalism does a lot of harm. Um, and that right now, we have a particular brand of capitalism um, that is, is, is especially evil. Not to give the old capitalism a pass, I'm like, that was the really great capitalism. But this is a capitalism that creates such a small set of winners and so many economic losers that people know what's happening, but nobody on our side, in any real scaled way, is speaking to everyday Americans and helping people make meaning of what's happening. And that's got to be a shift. I mean, I'm slowly in meetings across the country hearing people say things that they didn't feel comfortable saying. And I think the Wall Street financial crisis 
just help that. But we have to speak truth in our narrative and big ideas that we're not going to shift what's possible. And the third is, like I said in the beginning, these guys had a plan. They actually had a 40-year vision of what they wanted to change. So National People's Action, we just we, we were very engaged in the work around financial reform and going into the banks uh, after the crash. We actually moved more people in the streets preoccupied than any organization in the country. So we gave our best shot, and we're pretty let down by the results. So we went and we did some soul searching. We said, well, we need to build independent political power. We got to win the ideology, ideology battle. And then third, we actually need a long-term structural reform agenda. So we spent a year with 500 of our most core members. These could be family farmers, the unemployed, workers, public housing residents, actually studying the corporate conservative agenda. And what was most telling to our base was the fact that this agenda wasn't just about amassing profits. It was actually about aggregating power methodically over a set of elections and a set of decades. And that was game changing for folks. And so we said, well, let's build a long-term agenda toward the new economy. And somewhere, we haven't found them, but somewhere there are pamphlets in this building of this long-term agenda. So 500 people build a long-term agenda of what they wanted the economy to look like in 40 years. But the key breakthrough is saying, like, well, what are the structural reforms we have to win over a series of years? And we define structural reforms as reforms that take power away from the opposition or give power to people. And in organizing, we've historically said the two things we ask about when we get to getting into an issue fight is will it change people's lives and will it build an organization? But we think if we're going to go up against the corporate sector, we have to, have to amass a series of small structural reforms that take away their power, give us power, and create a codified shift in who has power in the next fight. And then and what we found with our members is actually a credible strategy. So it's not the dreamy, here is the loving new economy we're going to have in 40 years that seems kind of crazy considering the nature of now. But with a credible strategy, people can start to buy into it. So, and I just, I would just say in closing, like if we're serious, if, we're, if we want to like rein in corporate power or make it a little less, you know, a little less evil, we can do that through some of the routes we're heading on now. But I think if we're actually talking about a complete restructuring of their purpose in our society, it's going to have to get uncomfortable um, because a, a set of people get great benefit from this system and they're not going to give it up without a fight. And so I just say in closing, we all have to be prepared, and I think clearly a lot of people here have done this, like take a new set of physical risks, reputational risks, and political risks. And I, I would say if we really want to do this, buckle up. Thank you. So I think that's a great transition into Britain, who will talk about the campaigning that Brock has been doing, which I think is really building power, and, and especially their corporate work. All right, so my name is Britton. I won't stand. Like George, because I, I tripped over a gas pump in my toes. It's killing me for some time now. It's just amazing. But I, uh, I'm, so, so I, I walk with a slight limp these days, but hopefully that goes away. So I'm Britton. I work with Rock United, as Sarah said, uh, Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. Uh, it's the banner. Uh, we work on behalf of about 10 million restaurant workers. Um, we were founded after the World Trade Center's collapse to help displaced restaurant workers find work. Um, since then, demand has grown. As you know, uh, just finding work isn't the only issue that affects restaurant workers. Um, so there are tons of issues that affect uh, the folks that we work on behalf of, and that's um, that's why we're here. So Rock is 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 in a fight against um, against many different actors, but some of the main actors um, that. We are working to change, and I guess you could say, add a little education into their, into their, into their policies and their their processes that they do on a day to day basis. Um, so uh, we, one of the main actors. Well, first let me say the fights that we have been involved in range from raising the minimum wage providing earned sick time to even the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act, right? So it's a broad set of issues that affect restaurant workers. And the, one of the main actors that we have been looking toward to make some changes into this, into the restaurant industry, to change the industry, is Darden uh, Restaurants. Darden owns Red Lobster, everybody knows Endless Shrimp Time, right? Cheddar Biscuits and so on, Olive Garden. Um, um, Bahama Breeze, these folks, right? They, they, they have 20, 21, 2,100 locations worldwide, really large, the world's largest restaurant corporation, and they employ about 200,000 workers. That's a huge swath in the restaurant industry, and they are one of the main 
members of the National Restaurant Association. So the National Restaurant Association is a lobby here in D.C., right? And they're a part of that. They're a huge part of it. They're so, so much of a part of it that, that like the National Restaurant Association might take a back seat if Darden were going into a state to lobby. Okay, so that's just to give you their, 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 their portion of the pie. So during the last several years in the economic, of the economic crisis in America, uh, Darden and the National Restaurant Association have upped their lobbying expenditures. expenditures. They spend millions on top of millions on top of millions, more money than I have, more money than they could, you know, just a lot of money they're spending, right? And they're spending this money lobbying to keep the rights of workers down and suppress. And so you'll see pieces, you'll see their lobbying expenditures go up when, when measures such as the minimum wage are put forward, when measures such as paid sick days are put forward, or earned sick days in some cases. Um, but you'll see their lobbying expenditures go up. And a good example of this would be, um, would be the Orlando earned sick time ballot measure. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but folks like us, worked really hard to gather about 50,000 signatures to put earned sick time on the ballot so restaurant workers wouldn't have to come to work to say. Well, that wasn't, you know, Darden didn't like that process and they didn't like folks like us going out to gather that many signatures. So what they did along with Disney, they went and helped Disney and they said, we gotta stop this. So they go to the Orlando Board of Commissioners they lobby them, the Orlando Board of Commissioners says we're not gonna put it on the ballot this election, right? And so it gets pushed forward and forward and they went to court and so on and so on, right? But the bottom line is that they spent money and they were able to suppress the voice of the people. They then went to the state, which they're doing in 17 other states, the American Legislative Exchange Council and uh, the NRA and lots of more actors, right? They went there to the state to the state legislatures and they're preempting legislation in municipalities and localities, right? So they'll say, we're gonna pass a bill in the state legislature that pre prohibits a municipality from passing an ordinance like raising the minimum wage or earning sick time, right? So this, this, this is just getting like, it's getting sinister, right? And so they're taking the power away from municipalities to enact legislation on behalf of workers. So, that's no surprise to us, and it's also no surprise that because that they are uh, uh, taking these measures, it's no surprise to us that servers and restaurant workers are, some, are the lowest paid people in the state, right? It's the lowest paid occupation. You see uh, restaurant workers own food stamps two to three times more than, than the average low wage worker. Um, you saw this summer, and you're still seeing some of it, where uh, restaurant workers are standing up against McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and so on, and they're saying, we want $15 an hour, we want this, we want that. And you saw, you see now that a bill has been put forward on, Con on the Hill, which we're working with IPS, and Sarah and John have been really great working with us on that. But the bill was put forward to raise the minimum wage, it's called the Fair Minimum Wage Act. It would raise it to $10.10, and then it would also raise the tip minimum wage that has been frozen for 22 years, right? This is Herman Cain's legacy, right? And in a way, it, it impacts women more than it does anyone else because women make up the majority of restaurant servers, right? And so, so we are fighting to, to increase the minimum wage, but you know, we get the same opposition as all the time, the NRA and DART, and they're there to oppose, and then oppose that measure. And I just want to read a story really quick, really fast, and I can read well. I think I can, at least. So. Yeah. so this is Carolina. She's from New York in a state that has a $5 tip minimum wage. I've been a server in New York City for seven years. I earn $5 an hour plus tips. On average, I'd say I make between $400 and $500 per week, including tips, but it is not steady because it depends on tips, and it depends on how many shifts my manager gives me. Tips are, used, are unsteady based on the time of day, day of week, season of year, and how the customer is feeling. If I don't make enough for rent, I borrow money from friends. In the past, I used to put it on my credit card, but now I'm in a lot of debt. So I learned my lesson. I try not to borrow, but sometimes I have to. This week, for example, I am only scheduled to work three shifts, so I'm probably gonna have to borrow from a fan this month. I don't wanna think about it, I don't wanna do it, but I might have to. One of the sad things is that when you work in a restaurant, most of the servers are starving. We are all broke, 
but also because there are long hours and no breaks, so we're all starving. We're, we, always, we are always complaining about it, how it's ironic that we are serving food and we are hungry. Most of the servers I know are broke. They rely on families uh, to feed them. Um, she says, she goes on to say that she doesn't eat family meals because she's a vegetarian. And not having enough money just becomes a part of your daily life. So you learn to live with it. But it doesn't mean that it's right. And so we have begin, begun to assemble these worker stories in a site it's called livingofftips.com. So if you are aware, please go submit your story. And we've begun to submit these. Uh, we've begun to gather these and, and aggregate these so that we have a, a bank. Because, you know, because on the Hill and here in Congress and the state legislatures, those stories matter. And so not only have we begun to gather stories, but we've been taking action. Just this past September, we were in Orlando uh, protesting right outside Garden shareholder meeting. <laughs> Faith community, labor community, and even we had investor support were all a part of, of our action, both inside the shareholders meeting to ask questions like, you know, um, why are you paying 213 an hour? Uh, when's the last time, you know, what's, why did you lobby to not disclose CEO pay, and so on, right? So so those are the things that we've been uh, really working on to kind of hold that corporate power accountable. Another thing that uh, we did where we participated in was uh, I kind of play off the civil rights movement. Um, it's kind of got, a, got some press where we did, you know, so sit-ins, but we did tip-ins. So we would go and we'd sit in and kind of slow business down and uh, get up and, and let people know what the problem is and why we're doing this. So we're gonna keep pushing. You know, I, I love for you guys to join us in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you, Greg. Right now we've heard from two very dynamic leaders here in the in the U.S. arena. We're going to now move to the international arena and hear from Fiona Dove from Transnational Institute. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much. And I, I'd like to say a very uh, hearty congratulations to IPS for surviving 50 years. It's, I just find that so exciting, so incredible. <laughs> There's really not that many organizations, uh, particularly on the, on the left, that survived a uh, half a century. Um, but thanks very much. My previous incarnation, I also organized restaurant workers, so it's very inspiring we should talk. to hear your story. Yes, we should, although that was a long time ago. Okay, I've been asked to, to outline the global campaign for a people's treaty for internationally binding obligations for transnational corporations. It's a real mouthful, I think. <laughs> What uh, this campaign's about is about legal accountability for transnational corporations. The campaign grew out of three people's tribunals. This is the permanent people's tribunal that, that Bertrand Russell set up, which probably remembers very well, uh, many years ago. Um, the, the framework of the institution has remained, and we've used that to hold tribunals to, hold, to, to try transnational corporations. So we held... Um, three of these between 2006 and 2010. The focus was on the operations of European transnational corporations in Latin America. Uh, affected communities documented over 40 cases uh, where European transnational corporations were doing bad things in Latin American countries. This included uh, pollution of the environment, denying rural people access to traditional uh, commons, lands, forests, rivers that people have traditionally lived off. Companies were often using paramilitary force to prevent workers accessing uh, those common areas. Uh, cases where workers were, were being treated badly, being paid badly, not getting contracts, not being allowed to form unions. And also cases uh, where, for example, companies had bought up um, privatized public services like water utilities. And the result was that water prices went up so high that local people could no longer afford water. So these were the kinds of cases that were presented to these tribunals. The juries were drawn uh, from prestigious people, including legal people, uh, from both continents. Um, and what, what emerged from these cases was a bigger pattern. Firstly, that there was something dreadfully wrong with the model of development if these kinds of practices were allowed to, to happen. 
Secondly, that people were powerless in the face of these companies, and the governments were either not able or were not willing to defend the public interest. And we'll continue to expose the architecture of impunity. So again, we're publishing and publicizing the reports on the crimes of transnational corporations, on the injustice of these trade and investment treaties that don't oblige TNCs to respect uh, international human rights laws, etc., and which put profit before the public interest. And we hope that providing that by providing these arguments and this kind of evidence, that we can have some kind of influence on journalists, on uh, academics, uh, policymakers, parliamentarians, get them engaged in um, uh, promoting this idea that transnational corporations must be held, or must, there must be some kind of international legal mechanism to hold transnational corporations to account. Meanwhile, of course, there are thousands of communities and exploited workers all over the world <coughs> that are fighting real life and death struggles over their rights. So we also, as part of the campaign, as part of building the movement, will continue to uh, publicize these struggles, to help link people around the world, um, foster solidarity among them, uh, with them, and at the same time, through this People's Treaty, provide some kind of common vision through which we can all work towards. We now have coordinators employed, getting somewhere. Uh, in Africa, we have a, a, a part-time person whose job it will be to coordinate the entire continent. I don't envy her job. Um, we also have uh, someone based in Brazil whose job it is to coordinate for Latin America as a well. whole. And we have people at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam who, whose job it is to coordinate in Europe and to help uh, coordinate things internationally. Uh, an international steering committee will be formed in the next couple of months, made up of all the organizations that have signed on to this campaign, which also includes the World March for Women and La Via Campesina, the Small Peasants Confederation of the World, so we're getting some big allies on board. Um, and this International Steering Committee will take joint responsibility for fundraising, we feel that's really important, um, and will oversee the work of the coordinators and of the campaign, and will monitor the effectiveness of the strategy that um, starts unfolding. Um, already, actually, we're very encouraged by, we, we feel a certain momentum um, around this issue of legal accountability to TNCs, and just last month, 100 governments uh, submitted a petition, or rather Ecuador, the Ecuador government submitted, submitted a petition, but it was supported by 19, 99 other governments, um, calling for an international court to try TNCs that cannot be prosecuted under domestic jurisdiction. It's quite amazing. And this, this has come on the back, you probably all know about John, John Ruggie's um, protect, respect, uh, uh, remedy framework. John, John Ruggie, in case you don't know, is the UN Secretary General's Special Representative on uh, Business and Human Rights. And Ruggie's framework was released quite recently. And he talks about the duty of states to protect people's rights, the duty of companies to respect people's rights, and the right of victims to uh, get remedy. The Ruggie framework, however, has been quite widely criticized for not going far enough. It doesn't actually offer mechanisms that could um, put into effect the principles um, of this framework. So our campaign intends to show how that can be done. So I hope very much that you'll join the campaign and you can find out how to get involved if you go to the special website called Stop Corporate Impunity, one word, dot org. And otherwise the pamphlets there have the website on and other information. Thank you very much. a lot of people in this room who would love to be a part of that process. So thanks for filling in on where things stand. So now we will hear from Peter Weiss, a Vice President of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Well, I want to begin by thanking Richard Barnett posthumously for writing the kinds of books that uh, Sarah has sitting in front of her. And uh, his research really brought to public attention the fact that corporations were not only not good citizens, but that many corporations were criminal. And uh, it, it was a tremendous accomplishment. I also want to thank Fiona, who thank God is very much alive and 
for setting this up for me because I think we're going to have an interesting discussion about whether there should be an international tribunal or whether there should just be the enforcement of existing laws. But let me just give you my uh, five minute synopsis of the rise and fall of the Alien Tort Claims Act, which is very much related to this subject. It started one day with a, a meeting that my colleagues at the Center for Constitutional Rights and I had with a then unknown journalist named Seymour Hirsch, who uh, at this very minute is probably holding forth in one of the other rooms. <laughs> And uh, he told us that uh, he had to leave at 6 o'clock to catch a plane to Fort Benning. And we said, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to look for a guy who's responsible for the biggest massacre of the Vietnam War. And he went down there and he told me later that people claimed they'd never heard of Lieutenant Cowley. And after three days, a sergeant came up to him and whispered in his ear and said, you're looking for Cowley? He said, yes. He said, he's sitting up.